Zero to 100 is a podcast dedicated to bringing you quality conversations and insights on resiliency in physical, mental, social, and spiritual fitness through engaging discussions with those in the military and beyond. Hey folks, welcome to Zero to 100 podcast. I'm your host, Mark, with my co-host, Steve. And today, our awesome guest is... Uh, just it just gets better every time, and and every guest is able to really help us talk about and think through different important topics for the military and beyond. Uh, our guest today is Sergeant Major Josh Ortiz. There's a just a, a storied career that I could talk about, but in his 20 years of uh, very accomplished and diverse experiences, he's. Uh, machine gunner served all over the world, currently stationed in Okinawa, and I will let him kind of tell more of his war stories, but a, a decorated Marine, a combat Marine, he's got a bronze star with uh, a combat V, uh, three Navy comms, and three NAMs, six, con- six conduct, good conduct medals, and a combat action ribbon. But more importantly is that Sergeant Major Ortiz is a man who's really battled so many of the challenges that many, uh, many Marines, many men, uh, many, just many people uh, deal with in society and found ways to, and resources uh, to overcome them and is still fighting the good fight. So he's going to bring a lot uh, to the table when it comes to talking about resiliency, suicide prevention, Finding Hope, and some of the other great themes we want to get into today. But in typical fashion, I'm going to read a quote that I think is relevant to our conversation today to just some food for thought and get your wheels spinning. Uh, This is from a book called On Fire by John O'Leary. If you haven't read the book, it's a must read. He is a kid that gets on fire. 100% of his body is burned. The doctors say he has 1% chance of survival. He's eight years old. The kid has no skin anywhere. And just a powerful book. You cannot get through this book without getting goosebumps or crying. And page 53, he quotes a spiritual writer, Henry Nouwen, who says, we'd like to make a distinction between our private and public lives and say, whatever I do in my private life is nobody else's business. But anyone trying to live a spiritual life will soon discover that the most personal is the most universal. The most hidden is the most public. So with that, uh, Sergeant Major, I welcome you to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. What do you think about that quote uh, about the public and the private? And just, Yeah. yeah, does that energize you in any way? Yeah, I mean, it, first off, thanks for having me, Mark, Steve. Uh, that thing is, is, is more telling than probably anybody would be willing to admit, um, you know, to be transparent. And, you know, what you think is being hidden uh, is, really, is really all the way out there, likely. Um, yeah, that thing couldn't be more, you know, it, it couldn't hit more home for me. And, and it likely if people actually were honest with themselves, it, it hits home with them as well. Okay. Yeah, I, part of the battle is that, you know, military service and some of the challenges that deployments, uh, sort of inner demons, what we typically call, <laughs> creates is a separation, right, between a public life and a private life. And so one thing that stood out for me with your story is how you were just on the fast track in your career. And yet on the inside, it was a completely different story. Like, Say more about that. You know, the outward. Yeah, I mean, you was just yeah. right. You were just crushing it, but on the inside, something else was happening. Yeah, I mean, I have had really. If 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 you if if you knew the ins and outs of, of, of my career, um, you would say, "What's this guy got to complain about? What problems does he have?" Um, you know, I. I picked up meritorious staff sergeant in six years. I was combat meritorious gunny in nine, selected a first sergeant in 12, sergeant major in 16. 
Uh, and so, I mean, on, on the outside professionally, um, we would say that I've, I've, I've been pretty successful, not to toot my own horn, but it just, it, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I've had a very, very blessed career, right place, right time, great leadership taking care of me, great subordinates making me look good. Um, but on the inside, I, I, I hit a point uh, that I, I didn't actually ever even see coming. And I, I started to unravel slowly and steadily. I didn't realize it was happening uh, almost until it was too late. And uh, it kind of culminated at my time as a first sergeant to the point where uh, I, I kept track of, of every single one of my own personal suicidal ideations uh, to the numbers of 1,152. Uh, I, I don't know why I kept track of them. I just, hmm. uh, I just did. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's made for kind of a good attention gainer as I, as I kind of speak on various platforms, but um, nobody had any idea. Um, you know, my wife knew that, you know, some stuff was, was, was not right, uh, but she had no idea what I was going through professionally, my colleagues, my subordinates, my seniors, nobody had a clue. Um, yeah. It was very easy to hide uh, what I was going through. Hey, Sergeant Major, I wanted to kind of jump in here and say, I, I still remember the day that I first <clears throat> met you, which was at MAG 36. Um, and actually the first time I heard you tell your story was there at the Total Force Fitness Summit, uh, Total Fitness Summit with MAG 36. Yeah. And what I distinctly remember is when you asked the strongest Marine in the room to come up and hold just a few sheets of paper. And then, uh, then you began to tell your story um, and then at the end, you know, that Marine's arms were beginning to droop and how uh, he had to get other Marines to come. If, if they figured it out in the audience, they would come up and hold his arms and help him. And I think that that really goes in with the quote that Mark read that, you know, those hidden things are like those sheets of paper. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just would like to ask you, you know, so that story that you told um, to those Marines that day in that auditorium, if you could just share uh, with our listening audience that story today. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've had, I've had a pretty good career and uh, I did end up finding myself, uh, you know, in, in counseling uh, on, on, on medication, just kind of, kind of trying to unpack or un unpack, you know, where this started to go off the rails. And I, I was able to, uh, with the blessing of time, uh, able to kind of rewind the clock and look back at the at the film footage, uh, you know, you know that I'd been through, and I, I was able to kind of pinpoint at the time where uh, I just picked up Gunny and uh, I was taking my family overseas on uh, embassy duty. We were really excited. Uh, we were getting ready to be posted in uh, West Africa, which it was a little nerve wracking for my wife. I had a one year old son, a three year old daughter. Uh, lots of vaccinations that they had to have trying to get a one and three year old to take, you know, anti-malaria pills is a, is a challenge in and of itself. Um, but we were excited to be there and uh, we, we, we loved our time there. Uh, but unfortunately my family's time got cut short and uh, they, uh, the, the country I was in had a, had a coup. Uh, and for the listeners, if you don't know what a coup is, basically what happened in the country was, the faction of the military wasn't happy with the government. Uh, they decided to grab their tactical vehicles, BMPs, tanks, etc., heavy machine guns, and everything, and basically took over the cities on the presidential palace, and you know, overthrew the government. Lots of fighting in the in in the city. Uh, nothing towards the embassy at all. Like the Marines were, and, and 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 the embassy personnel were fine, but our families were out living among the local population. And it, it, it immediately became a very stressful time for me personally um, because I'm there in, in, in the embassy and my wife and my children are in the safe haven in their house with, you know, a radio, water and, and, and MREs. And they're just trying to wait this thing out and days turn to weeks. Uh, you know, eventually our families were able to uh, actually become, you know, evacuees. Um, but it was... It, 
it was stressful because you know I was I'm, I'm an infantryman by trade, so you know I, I'm 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 not new to the risks associated with you know everything that comes along with the chaos that 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 country was going through, but it's a whole other thing to inadvertently drag your family into what then became a war zone and uh, just the safety and everything for my family. It was just, it was a huge concern on me. And by the time they were able to leave, uh, my buddy and I, we took both our families. We had some armored vehicles, took them to the airport. They flew out and uh, on our way back, uh, my buddy asked me if I wanted to come over for dinner. We were, we were essentially neighbors. And I said, yeah, of course I do. Uh, but I, I need to go PT first. And for me, it was important uh, as, as, as much a relief as I had that my family was gone, I could still feel just a, an immense amount of, of weight on my shoulders that I knew I needed to unload. And I know PT is great for that. So I hit the gym, you know, I didn't need to warm up back then like I do now for about 20 minutes or so. So I just cranked the music, hit the pull-up bars and uh, I hit my third rep and uh, I, I started bawling like a baby. And uh, I, I jumped off the bar, I looked at myself in the mirror. You know, I said, hey, look, you know, get your stuff together. You got Marines are looking to you for strength. You got an embassy that's looking to you for security. Uh, you got a family who needs to know that you're okay here. Uh, you're a man, you're a Marine, suck it up. Or what, my tears, turn the music up a bit louder, hit the pull up bars again. Same thing, as soon as I hit three, I don't know what the magic number of three was, but I hit three again and I just started bawling like a baby again. So I just said, well, I guess today's a rest day, you know, and I, and I went over to my buddy's house and, uh, and he introduced me to the best coping mechanism on the planet. You guys, you guys know what it is? It, uh, alcohol. Uh, I know it's, I know Sergeant Major's not supposed to say that, right? But I'm telling you, it's the best coping mechanism there is. There's nothing uh, that you can get that's so readily available, over the counter, inexpensive. I mean, there is a bottom shelf uh, that will make you feel like all your problems have gone away almost instantaneously. And uh, what's important about this particular event in my life is up until then, I didn't really drink at all. I had about one buddy that we'd get together a couple times a year, have a few beers, you know, making weekend barbecues with the family. And, and, and that was really it. I, I didn't really drink. And, and more importantly, uh, I never had used alcohol to cope with stress. And I spent about the next eight months there uh, without the family. Uh, this is a, this it was a, it was it was an unexpected separation. I think at this point, I'd probably had about five or so deployments in about nine, 10 years. That's a lot for some. That's not, you know, that's not as many as, as, as others, but it's just what it was. But my, my point is we weren't, my wife and I weren't strangers to separation, to workups, to deployments. But this was supposed to be, this was supposed to be accompanied with the family. We've been dreaming about this for years uh, and it kind of got ripped out from under us. And so those eight months, uh, you know, I, I kept PT, but I was also just, I kind of got in a habit of drinking, which had never really been a part of my life before. Uh, fast forward, uh, I got to my next post in in, uh, in Central Europe. My family reunited with me, so you think everything, you know, was great, and you know the stars have aligned. I'm in a great country in Central Europe. Uh, you know, I, I got my family with me, and uh, but what I didn't realize is that a, a, a part of me had kind of changed, and. <clears throat> My family and I, specifically my wife and I, we did not really reconnect well. I've sat through countless, uh, you know, post-appointment briefs where usually the chaplains talking about reintegrating with family and wives and husbands and everything else. And I never really paid much attention to them. My wife and I had been together like forever. I met her, I was in eighth grade. She was a sophomore and we've, and we've just been together for over half my life and uh, really never had any significant problems. But uh, my failure to integrate with my wife and, and my family really took a toll uh, on us uh, to the point where uh, I, I basically just continued to live in my house with my family almost as a single, almost as a single guy. I was out, you know, 
partying, not really partying, but out in bars, hanging out late at night, multiple times a night, not just on the weekends, but just, just living kind of the same life I'd been living at my last post by myself. And uh, it didn't sit well, you know, with my wife. And it, it obviously wasn't good for my relationship with my kids. Um, but the first night I ever came home really, really drunk, um, I'd left my car. I, uh, I, 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 I wasn't driving, but I, I'd, I'd left my keys as well. So I, I couldn't get into my house. I thought I'd been out all night. Uh, it was actually only seven o'clock at night when I rang my own doorbell and my wife came to the door and she sees me and, you know, she's looking at me. She goes, are, are you know, are you serious? Like, what, what is this? Uh, you know, of course the apologies come out, right? I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this is not, this has never happened before. Uh, that was a lie. Uh, it, this will never happen again. Uh, that was a lie. Um, I said, you know, just let me go to bed. I'll wake up and keep apologizing in the morning. Um, didn't really change any of my habits after that. Just kind of continued down that road and being the strong, like great foundation she is for my family. Uh, she eventually just kind of had enough and just called me out. I was like, listen, like grown men don't need to be told to come home and be with their families. Fathers don't need to be told to play with their kids. Like this isn't a thing, like you're grown, like this needs to stop. Now, my wife and I have a very, uh, a very sarcastic kind of love in, in our relationship. We kind of banter back and forth with a lot of sarcasm and I've developed a pretty good amount of wit. Uh, and so my response to this, you know, to her telling me I need to stop was, uh, was I say, hey, listen, uh, you said before God and everybody uh, that no, you know, for better or worse till death do us part, right? No matter how bad it gets until one of us dies uh, and, and I'm not dead yet. This is just who I am now and you're going to have to accept it. Well, naturally that brought us closer together. There's my sarcasm there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the problem was uh, I got, I was still killing it at work, right? I ended up, you know, my detachment was, you know, was, was, one of the des was one of the best detachments in the region. My Marines are getting tons of recognition. Uh, I ended up getting selected for first sergeant. So like, to me, like, why would I, like, I'm clearly doing well. Why would I change anything about what I'm doing? Um, the promotion to first sergeant, you know, comes with orders as it does. And uh, I ended up uh, in a unit uh, on, uh, on, on I and I duty that I, I, I did not want to go to. Um, and it just, I had a dream of being a first sergeant and all that comes with that. And I just, I didn't get what I wanted. And I was in an area that I didn't want to be at. And I really went in there with a bad taste. And I'd never had that kind of uh, response to an assignment before, you know, everybody says bloom where you planted and, you know, make the best of it. And I just, I just did not go in with that mentality. And so it was just kind of another notch of things that were new for me and stresses that I was experiencing that, that I wasn't prepared for. And I didn't even think about, um, how to recognize and like deal with them. And when I got to the unit, uh, I, an, another new stressor for me was uh, was the most toxic command climate I'd ever been in, and uh, the unit had they had not passed an inspection in and I think years, and I also noticed there's some red flags when I'm doing uh, doing outbound interviews with career Marines who are like career staff and COs who are getting out of the Marine Corps before retirement. That's not usually a thing. So for me, this is kind of a red flag. And what the Marines were telling me was, hey, listen, like we really hit the boss pretty bad. I'm getting out, you know, because of this. And if you're curious why we haven't been passing inspections, uh, it's because we've been actively failing, trying, hoping that the boss would get fired. And I was like, whoa. Uh, my boss and I did not get along ever. I don't, I, I don't think one day. And as, as successful as I felt, um, he uh, he personally, you know, belittled me and and marginalized me, and it started affecting the way 
that I felt about, you know, my performance and like what was going on. And so now this, like what I thought was a pretty good career and I was doing pretty well, um, that slowly started to kind of turn my professional image of myself. And, uh, Josh, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for a second yeah, because there's so much that I want to bring out yeah. of your story for the listener that we just covered. Uh, so going back to the, you know, the gym and then the, the random emotional burst, like, and the evolution of things since then. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh, that division between like success at work and on the inside, things are just not going right and they're getting worse. And now you kind of got to a command where you have a, you have a terrible boss, the command climate is bad. Do you think that was a blessing in disguise that actually now on the outside, uh, there wasn't this contrast of, you know, you were sort of imploding, but on the outside that kept you sort of believing in, you know, this sort of illusion that, oh, things are not bad. Like, I'm curious, what is happening when somebody feels hopeless, right? Like, were you feeling hopeless at some point or, or, or were you believing in the outward appearance of things? So I, I, I was very much so believing on the outward appearance of things at, at, at first. Um, I was heavily reliant on what I realized now is my pride in, mm. Uh, in, in convincing myself that like I'm 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 good enough to fix this, like I can fix this. I don't need I I don't need to call a buddy. I don't need to talk about my feelings. Uh, you know I don't need counseling and medication. Like like those weren't even like thoughts that like were going through my head. The only thing that was going through my head was is that uh, like you're better than than what's going on. You know you can fix this. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. You'll probably just figure it out tomorrow. And that's what I was, that's what I was very heavily relying on, uh, for a, for a very, very long time. So, and that's just where, yeah. You started off by saying you, you counted the number of ideations you've had. I really respect that because we're in a culture where I think, whether it doesn't matter whether you're in the military or not, like somebody has an ideation and it's, it's kind of like treated like a symptom, right? Like, how do we fix this? How do we get rid of this? <laughs> and if you read any literature, if you read any history, you'll find that all civilizations since the beginning of time, they've had a closer relationship with death than we do currently in the West. What I mean by that is like, if you read the book uh, Tribe, and I mentioned this with, with our interview with Juan too, he talks about, and, and on killing, right? Lieutenant Colonel Grossman also talks about this, where yep. because yeah. of our proximity to death, right? So back in the day, people would have to go grab the chicken in the back. Or people still do, as you know, in many parts of the world, they grab the chicken from the back and then they wring its neck and they, like, they're seeing death in front of them. Life and death, that chicken that just died is now providing food and nourishment for the living. And in the native culture, that's a very common thing as well, right? In hunting and how they uh, have this relationship with, uh, you know, the meat that they source. So along those lines, I wonder uh, how much of the stigma, how much of like, well, I shouldn't be having suicide ideations. Does that, how much does that feed into like making the situation worse? And secondly, when you had those ideations, like I think of suicide ideation as ultimately a belief problem, okay? When I say a belief problem, what I mean is you could have two Marines, both are crushing it, and one can be very fulfilled and satisfied on the inside, whereas the other one, like you, although on the outer, uh, you know, you're in, in the outside, you were just, you know, doing everything you're supposed to and beyond you are imploding on the inside. I believe that's a belief problem, like a belief about self, a belief about life, a belief about the world. So I'm curious, would you describe those ideations as a sense of hopelessness or what, how would you describe that? Um, so it, it, I, 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 I think your parallels to, to like, you know, our, 
our our sense of death are pretty are pretty spot on here throughout my time with with my own ideations it was very much so like i was almost like at like in a war zone with myself and i made I made peace with myself and with my family and everybody else every time I went into combat or every time I went or deployed somewhere. And, you know, you kind of feel like, you know, if it's your time, it's your time. And it, 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 it just kind of is what it is. I know my family is going to be taken care of, you know, financially, they're going to be okay. You know, you know, emotionally, there's probably going to be some damage, but, you know, life will go on. You know, if, if, you know, if you, you know, when people die in combat or in accidents, you know, or, or kind of whatever. And that's very much so where I was with my own thoughts of suicide was I'm, I, I'm, I'm at peace with this. I, like, I, I, I understand death. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not new to, you know, the risks associated with it. And I know my family will be okay. Life will go on. And, and, and that's just kind of like where I was. And so the times where I was, where I was feeling kind of hopeless, I was also kind of, uh, I was also kind of at peace, I guess you could say. And it's, it, it sounds strange even for me to say it. It probably sounds strange to listeners to hear it, but um, it wasn't this like, you know, it, it didn't feel like this downward spiral, but more of kind of like a low flat line that I was just kind of sitting at and just, just kind of at peace with. And, and, I, and I never wanted to die, um, but, uh, you know, at, at, at some point, life just, it just, I was in so much pain, you know, emotionally, mentally, physically, uh, even, even socially, um, to where it was just like, it just, it just really, really hurt. And, and, and I don't think that, I, I think people think that they can understand it conceptually, but unless you've been there, I, I don't know that you'll either, I don't, I don't know that you'll actually ever really grasp uh, what people who are in that situation in that moment in time, like how they're actually feeling. Yeah, no, yeah. I, everything you're saying has just so much uh, wisdom and insight, I think that, and it's, it's a common story, especially in the military. Uh, I, I, it's profound what you said that you felt peace when you had those thoughts. And I wonder how much of that is yeah, we, we kind of have to accept death, right? It is, uh, obviously suicide itself is, is a problem. It's not something that we should pursue. But, Agreed. But the thought of death, the thought of, okay, ending it and what death means uh, definitely is not contemplated enough in our sort of triumphalistic society, right? Like you could do anything, you could live forever. <laughs> you know, you could just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the idealisms that, that we kind of embrace. So w w when did you ever feel hopeless? Like what was hopelessness like for you? Like, can you describe that? The hopelessness was, it was, it was lonely. Um, you know, my, my home life was terrible. My work life was terrible. I, I wasn't finding joy or any sort of sense of accomplishment at, at, at either one of those places. Um, I, I really stopped kind of enjoying anything other than being alone, um, which obviously doesn't work well for, you know, a married man with kids and, you know, being a senior enlisted leader in, you know, in the Marine Corps, um, you're, you're always surrounded by people, but as, as large as my gatherings were, I still just, I still just felt very, very, very lonely. And like, I had no place, like I had no place to go um, to the point where, you know, even if I wasn't successful in my suicide, uh, I would just, I, I, I assumed I'd end up in the hospital and I would at least have some other place to go than work and home. And for me, that sounded better than, you know, being at work or being at home. Um, because yes, hopelessness for me was very, it was very lonely, and uh, despite knowing I had colleagues I could pick up the phone or reach out to, I mean, I carried <laughs> I carried a de-stress pen and, and you know in my lapel, you know, in my blouse, and just but still, like it just even knowing that there's all these resources and stuff that are out there, it's just I don't know. Like I said earlier, my pride was in my way, and I just kept convincing myself, you know, you'll fix it tomorrow, uh, you know, 
just get through tonight and you know we'll see what tomorrow brings yeah hey, sure let me let me jump in here and say that uh that that's definitely a theme that i know i have seen in in talking with folks and also it's a theme that is on the spiritual fitness guide that we uh have created for the Marine Corps. Um, for those that are listening, if you uh, just go to uh, the website, um, the USMC website for uh, fitness and resilience, um, there's a page for spiritual fitness. And, and on there is the spiritual fitness guide. And the second indicator that's listed on that spiritual fitness guide is talking about hope. So we're actually coming to the end of our time here for this first session. But as we do, I wanna ask one final question for you, Sergeant Major, and then we'll, we'll kind of end there. And then we're going to pick up this uh, podcast in the next uh, recording. But, um, but like I said, the second item on the spiritual fitness guide is about hope. And I'm going to read the different indicators. And Sergeant Major, I would just like you to tell me which one of these best describes you at that time that you're describing to us when you're at that command and things were kind of hitting rock bottom. So the first one says, I'm hopeful about life in the future. The second one says, less hopeful about life in the future. And then uh, the third one says, holds very little hope about life in the future. And then the last one is, holds no hope for life in the future. Which one of those do you think best describes, described you at that time? Man, that's a tough question. Um, I, I would say, I would say I was probably, uh, I, I had very little hope. Uh, yeah, very little hope. Like I said, I was I was convinced I could take care of it on my own. Um, I've kind of come up with the mantra nowadays that if, if you could if you could fix it on your own, you would have by now. So, you know, get help. But you know, I kind of I've kind of realized that mantra years years later. Um, that the, the only hope I had was in myself. Which is why I say very little hope. I had, you know, I I I I grew up in the church. I've been a Christian my whole life. Um, I mean, so I know, I know, uh, I knew a lot about spiritual fitness. Um, you, know, you know, a good deal about physical fitness. Um, I've always been very, uh, very social and kind of the funny guy. The, you know, the jovial guy in the room that kind of, you know, you know, usually breaks the mood that, you know, if it's down or whatever. So, you know, my social fitness seemed, seemed, you know, seemed pretty strong, but even with all those, all those areas, I wasn't, I, I, I couldn't even see those. I was so, I was so hopeless that the only thing that I, that I thought I'd convinced myself I had uh, was myself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to end this first session there. And for those of you that are listening, uh, here's the good news. The story uh, gets uh, better. Uh, sorry, Major. Uh, yeah, spoiler alert. a great rest of the story. So, um, so we're going to stop the recording here, but please join us in the next session uh, here on Zero to 100 because uh, we got much more to this story to hear and also um, some, some thinking through about what to do after treatment and recovery. So join us next time. Well, welcome back, folks, to Zero to 100. We continue our conversation with Sergeant Major Josh Ortiz. And the last segment, we talked about hope or the loss of hope and how, for him, it was an experience of feeling extremely lonely. I think that is very uh, powerful. Uh, and just, man, I, I have so much respect for you and, and just, just your honesty, your vulnerability. You know, I once looked up the CDC guide you know, on what is the number one cause of suicide. And they said it was connectedness or the lack thereof. And I wonder, you are a Sergeant Major. You have plenty of people around you. And you also have friends. You have Marines that you've come up with. You have your wife. You have your family. And man, how is it that we feel lonely? And I say we because this is not your, just your problem. This is everybody's problem, right? Especially people who are in positions of leadership is even worse. And when I talk to senior leaders and I say that, I'm like, hey, sir, ma'am, don't forget I'm your chaplain, right? Because <laughs> I know it's lonely at the top. 
every now and then one of them would say, Chaplin, and you too, like, hey, I know you need somebody. And I was like, absolutely. So what is that? What, 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 how would you describe your experience with that where you say you just felt so lonely? Let, let's try to unpack that more. What is happening when we have so many people around us, such a big network, and yet we still feel so alone? Yeah, well, you know, you said it, and, and, and everybody at their, you know, respective top says it. Everybody believes it. I haven't run into one sergeant major, commander, master gunner, sergeant, like anybody who doesn't say it's not lonely at the top. Um, and, and that's because these aren't like, I mean, this is a job, right? And as, as, as social as we are in a, in, in a workplace, these often aren't uh, genuine, you know, connections we're making throughout the day that, that satisfy that need for closeness that like actually, yeah. you know, you know, meet your need for real, genuine, you know, connectedness. And uh, we have great camaraderie in the core. You know, we're about to celebrate our birthday and, you know, we're all going to come together and, you know, we're going to oorah and it's going to be great and we're going to have some great memories. Um, but it, 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 at some point, it, it all goes away. Either you leave and go home and, you know, that connectedness that you have there with your colleagues is gone or you get out of the Marine Corps or you retire. And, you know, it's, 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 it's fleeting and not that it's not real or kind of genuine in its own purpose, but I don't think that it is as impactful as everybody thinks maybe it is or, or it should be. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of great friends out here in Okinawa on the island, uh, you know, and, and we would do anything you know, for each other in need, or even, you know, just simple asks, but, you know, it's not, it's not the same connectedness you have, you know, like, like with a spouse or like, like, you know, with your kids or, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't think it's as impactful as people think that it is or should be. So how did you get back on the path or how did you find hope again? What, what was that mm -hmm. journey like? <clears throat> It was a long one. Um, you know, my my plans for suicide, you know, because we're Marines, right? So we, I mean, we plan, we got to have a plan, right? And we know plan A is not going to work. So we got to have a plan B, a plan C. Um, but my plan A was, I, I, I just like, I, I just stopped wearing my seatbelt in my car and thinking, you know, I will eventually get into an accident at some point. Uh, and, you know, and, and that'll be it. And weeks went by, that didn't happen. So plan A's failed, check. Moving on to plan B. Uh, if you remember, one of my sources of stress was, was going to work every day, no job satisfaction, kind of a bad climate I was in. And uh, it was kind of a hairy intersection where you got to kind of like, you know, you're kind of fighting cross traffic. And on the other end was a nice big telephone pole. It was either raining or snowing where I was living at. So it would have been very plausible that I just lost control through this bad intersection, crashed into the pole, you know, and I'm gone. And uh, what what kept me from from executing that plan every day, uh, where I found hope, I guess, uh, was was the thought of my father. Um, I just I, I envisioned him at my funeral, and I, I don't know anybody alive that is prouder of me, loves me more, uh, you know, thinks more highly of me than my own father. And just the thought of this, I, I mean, I felt like I could see his heart literally just breaking and, uh, and I just couldn't do it. And so, uh, so I went to plan C and plan C was on my way home from work. I don't, cause I don't think I started to work on my marriage don't think I've stopped drinking heavily, um, but on my way home, I lived on kind of a dead man's curve, and in the right on the edge of my driveway was a huge tree. It's probably about five feet in diameter, and same thing, right? It could come in hot. Roads are slick. Just kind of overshot the, you know, overshot the driveway, and you know, bam, I'm dead in my front yard. Uh, sounds terrible, uh, you know, do in front of my family, but that's the that's the only truth. Uh, and what kept me from, 
from executing plan C. Uh, most people think it was my family. Uh, it, it wasn't, it was, uh, it was, it was the bottle of vodka in my center console. Uh, that was my hope at, at, at the time. And I'd sit in my driveway and slug down as much of I could, you know, as much as I could until I thought the pain was gone. And then I'd go in and just essentially be alone inside myself and, uh, and, 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 you know, just neglect my family. Uh, so not, neither one of those are, you know, sustainful, uh, areas of hope and, uh, kind of my rock bottom and, and where I, re and, and when I realized I needed to find, uh, I, I needed to find hope somewhere else was, I was sitting at home in my, in my chair, my wife was folding some laundry on the couch and my son, I think he was probably about, well, probably about four or five at the time. It was time for my kids to go to bed. And uh, he jumped up on my lap to, you know, give me a hug and tell me goodnight. And I kind of, kind of stiff armed him and you know, pushed him off of me. And I said, hey, hey, you know, daddy needs a space. And uh, when I did that, I, I, I did it a lot harder than, I, than I'd realized. And he kind of fell off and kind of rolled over. And when that happened, kind of just, it seemed like time stopped for me. And I could see countless, I could see all the neglect I'd been, I'd, I'd been bringing home to my family in just this millisecond of time. And my son, he got up. And he looks at me and he says, he said, daddy, don't you love me anymore? And I, I, I said, of course I do. So why would you say something like that? And he said, well, you don't put us to bed anymore. You don't read us bedtime stories. You don't tell us you love us. He said, I, I, I can't even give you a hug at night. And that's when I realized that uh, that's what I call my rock bottom. That's when I knew I needed, I needed to find something else, I, I I needed hope in in a in a better plan. I grabbed my son, grabbed my daughter, put him to bed, kissed him, told him I love him, read him a story, came back out, and I told my wife. I said, uh, I said, hey babe, I said it, it, it it's bad, and she said, I know, uh, and I said, you don't know, uh, it's it, it's a lot worse than you think, uh, and uh, I'm gonna go into work on Monday and go see the doc and get into some counseling and, you know, talk about some medication. And uh, she was a little worried um, what that might have been, you know, meant for us career wise, um, because there can be some, some, you know, implications that, you know, things may not go so well. There's definitely stigmas out there. People have their own personal opinions. Um, but I've done nothing but preach resources professionally, you know, for you know the better half of my career at this point. I spent the first half of my career hearing nothing but about resources that were out there. And so at that moment, kind of in my rock bottom, um, I went to what I knew kind of initially and what I knew kind of instinctively at this point through the institution was the resources. And I was willing to risk uh, you know, what this meant for me, potentially professionally, how people would treat me personally and professionally, colleagues, subordinates, seniors. Um, I don't know. I just immediately became hopeful in, 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 in the resources that, 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 that the Marine Corps had talked about for so long. Um, and sat through, I don't know how many PowerPoints and, you know, 101 days of summers and everything else that we do. I went, okay, I'm going to call your bluff. Let's see how this goes. Uh, and I did. And that was a, it was a really a very, very easy process. Um, you know, I went to, I went to the doctor. I said, Hey, I'm having, uh, I'm having kind of some anxiety stuff. I'm having trouble sleeping. I'm feeling a little bit depressed. Um, and I think, and I, I never, you know, he asked me, you know, questions about suicide, everything else. And I, I, I lied about all of it. Right. Um, but I think he knew by my demeanor and, you know, just kind of everything else, he knew there was more to it. There was no hesitation. He's like, I got you, man. Like, like, here's your, here's your, uh, here's, here's your referral, make your appointment, like, you know, you know, go on. And, um, 
counseling wasn't bad. It, it, it wasn't bad at all. Uh, I, I went in there looking for an easy button. Um, the very first session, I thought it was going to be weird, you know, like you see on TV with these people on couches and sharing their feelings and, you know, all the, but it, 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 it wasn't like that at all. Um, but there was also no easy button. I, I remember asking the, the doctor, I said, you know, uh, how long is this going to take? And, and he goes, I, he said, I don't know. I'm like, man, you should, don't you get paid to know? Like, <laughs> if you should be, you've been doing this a while. I assume like, you like, what do you mean? You don't know. I said, what's the average, right? Like maybe I don't, maybe I'm not that bad. So maybe I'm average with problems. Like, so like, what's the average? And he's like, it's like, there really isn't one. He's like, this could take, this could take a few months. This could take a few years. And I was like, bro, I, we, I don't have that kind of time. Like, like, I think I even said like, like we need to develop a POA and M for this thing. Right. Like <laughs> that's a, this, for, 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 for the seniors, that's your joke. Right. If, if you're junior listening to it, it's, it's an acronym for plan of actions and milestones. Right. We, we, you know, we have an objective to meet and we plan out timelines with milestones of things we need to accomplish in order to get to the objective. Uh, and he didn't get the joke, uh, but it wasn't really a joke either. I was, I was, I was very, I was very serious about planning this thing out. And like, you know, there, like there has to be an end in sight because I went in there. Uh, I went in there my first session where I thought the end was very near in sight. And I left my first counseling session uh, with no end in sight. And that was very, that was very frustrating to walk out of there for somebody who was looking for an easy button. And, uh, but I went back, I, I, I went back the next week and we talked, there was no like magical script or nothing. We just, we just talked, you know, I talked about the struggles I was having at home, struggles I'm having at work. Uh, and then I go home feeling like we'd accomplished nothing. Uh, but I go back the next week and we do it all over again. I leave feeling like we accomplished nothing. And like, he's not giving me answers. There's no script. Like there's no end in sight, but, but I stuck to it. And the more I went, the more hopeful I felt that either things would get better or they were getting better. And maybe I just didn't realize it yet. And time would kind of, you know, determine that. And uh, just as, just as kind of my, uh, my life was kind of unraveling, it's at, at some point during all this, uh, a little bit pre-counseling, I ended up getting hurt. I tore my rotator cuff and my biceps tendon. So I'd never been hurt before in the Marine Corps, not really, maybe a sprained ankle playing basketball. But other than that, I'd, I'd never been out of the game. And so to be hurt with an injury like that, they ended up taking about a year and a half to recover from, from beginning to end, um, was, was a significant part kind of of my downfall. As I was saying in the other, uh, and I think in the other session, you know, booze and PT were the mechanisms, but they were kind of, you know, the scales were kind of balanced in my life or so I was convinced. But then when I get hurt, uh, then all I got, you know, kind of is booze. And, uh, you know, that bottle of vodka in my, in my, in my center console was just one of about five bottles I would get through a week. And, uh, obviously that's not a kind of a, that's not a brag. That's, you know, that's kind of, that's terrible. Um, but I can remember, uh, my last session with my counselor and, uh, it wasn't planned. And it is something he told me very early on as I was searching for my easy button and my, and kind of where to fix. He just told me like, he said, Josh, you're going to, you're just going to know. He's like, I'm not going to know. You're going to know. And I'm like, man, maybe I should be getting paid to do this then. Not this guy. Right. Like, like if I, if like, if I have all the answers, maybe I should be on that side of the desk. But, uh, but yeah. It, and I, I remember like, as I was going through the counseling, you know, unfortunately, but kind of fortunately, my boss got fired um, just for kind of being a bad boss. Uh, they, they left me in charge for a significant amount of time. Um, 
I did end up getting better. Uh, you know, my shoulder did heal. I did end up getting back into PT. Uh, so that was getting, you know, there's one more kind of positive back into things. And, you know, none of those things in life that like kind of improved, uh, you know, I, 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 I did start making much more conscious efforts to connect with my wife. And, uh, you know, we started to do a lot more things together. The relationship starts to improve. I'm drinking a lot less as, you know, work, you know, my, 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 my work life, my, my personal life, my physical life, as, as those areas started to come back kind of in a positive manner, you know, counseling didn't, didn't fix those, right? It was just life. That was a time period where it was just really dark and, and, and really bad for me. And I stuck it out. I used some resources to kind of help mend it and kind of help get it along until life just wasn't so crummy anymore. And as the negativity slowly turned into positivity, I became much more hopeful in, in, in many other areas. Um, I got, I got connected with, uh, with a, uh, a, a faith-based organization that even, even the Brink Corps is kind of uh, on board with, Mighty Oaks Warrior Foundation. Uh, I, got, I, I got linked in with them to kind of, uh, kind of kickstart my, my uh, spiritual fitness back up again. Um, and so, yeah, so when we're talking about hope, you know, I just, as, as, as I found one little stepping stone, not stumbling block, stepping stone, kind of in a positive direction, I was able to see more that were coming and even even so i was able to uh realize the areas that i could affect on my own to where i knew i needed to be a better husband i knew i needed to be a better father um spiritually i i, I knew i needed to be a better christian and and those things don't happen on their own you know those take a a a, a conscious decision and knowing that if i would if I would just take a step forward in faith in all of those directions, just like I took a step forward in faith in the counseling, that uh, that it would it it would work. And so my hope in 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 all of those areas exponentially increased. And ultimately, I mean, my last counseling session, like I said, it wasn't planned. Um, I just walked in, I sat down. It was the only session we had in, in over a year where we sat quiet for minutes at the very beginning. What I expected the very first session to be like, we'd just be sitting there listening to the clock on the wall tick. But it was the last session that we were just sitting there listening to the clock tick on the wall for a few minutes. It felt like forever. And he finally just said, he said, what do you think? You know, what are you thinking? And I said, I said, I think this is it. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, I, I, you said I would know, and, and I think I, I think I know. And he said, well, why do you think that? And I said, well, I don't remember the last time I felt bad about myself. I don't remember the last time I was unhappy. I don't remember the last time I was anxious. I cannot remember the last time I felt depressed. And it could have been days, weeks, months. I, I literally have no idea. I just know when I walked that door and sat down, it just kind of like my whole life, I could see where it had improved and kind of bounced back. And that was my last session. Wow, what a great story. Um, and before we go any further on talking about the recovery side of things, um, I wanted to ask a real key question it's going to take us back, backtrack a little bit, but I want, I think it's important, especially for our audience. Um, and that question is, do, are we weak if we consider suicide? Is that a sign of weakness? Yeah. And I know in our, and uh, we talked a little bit about that and I, you said you had some real good thoughts on that. So please share what your ideas are on that, on that topic. So I, I asked my pastor years back, um, if you go to hell, if you commit suicide, uh, there is a belief that, you know, that that is a thing depending on the denomination. Uh, and we, we definitely won't be getting into, you know, theological debates here on this, on this podcast. Um, but he told me something, uh, very, that, 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 that really helped me, uh, and the way he believed and, and, and the way I believe is that we look at 
we should be looking at suicide as a, as a, as a sickness, as an illness. And if we look at it like that, right? I mean, we literally call it a mental illness, right? So if, if we look at it like somebody is sick, let's remove the word suicide and let's insert cancer. If somebody had cancer and, 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 and they were dying, would, would, would we consider them weak? I, I think the answer is no. Nobody would put some sort of stigma on there. Now, I realize that's a stretch, right? The parallels of, of suicidal ideations and cancer aren't, aren't, aren't necessarily the same thing, maybe, but we're also assuming that while cancer is not a choice, that suicide is a choice. Suicidal ideations is a choice. Um, and so if we wouldn't look at people with any other type of illness as though they were weak, why do we look at it as suicidal ideations is, is a weakness? I, I, I would say no, Steve. And I would say that uh, I am exponentially stronger because of what I went through. The reps and sets I got in 1,152 suicidal ideations. That's a lot of reps and sets. Mm -hmm. my, my mental strength these days is, is, is through the roof when it comes to suicide prevention, thoughts of suicide, uh, anxiety, depression. Like I know exactly what it looks like. I know exactly what it feels like. I'd be lying to you if I said that that they're gone and that I don't ever feel that way anymore, but because I know what those look like and I've put the reps and sets in and I've done the work, uh, I'm basically just taking recovery shakes at the end of the day. <laughs> I love the benefit of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm basically just yep. taking recovery shakes. Josh, when we talked about that, this topic before the interview, you said, how dark do you want to go? And I said, hey, as dark as we need to, because that's the, I think that's the disconnect that right? a lot of people feel in, in the Marine Corps and in the service in general, uh, where yeah, if you just go, I said that. If you just go I PG-13 that, Mark, on because, this, right? I, I, PG-13 I, I, I said on that, this, Mark. it's, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I, I said that because those times in my driveway slugging down vodka uh i can't tell you how many times alcohol saved my life hmm. that's that's the dark right wow that's the dark hmm. i can't tell you how many times alcohol saved my life i said it i think in the last in, in, in the last episode alcohol is the greatest coping mechanism it's it's a joke right it it it, it, it's not true. It, it is the worst coping mechanism. Uh, well, I take it back. It's not the worst coping mechanism. I, I have buddies who sat with a gun in one hand and a bottle in the other, and one of them's going in their mouth today. Which is it going to be? Mm. Well, well, the audience would say one's better than the other. If like if 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 we're talking in 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 absolutes here, one's better than the other. One, you're definitely not waking up tomorrow morning. The other you are. All your problems will still be there, but you will wake up tomorrow. It is not sustainable. Alcohol as a coping mechanism, definitely not sustainable. But like I said, I cannot tell you. Well, I can probably about half of that number. I won't do math in public. <laughs> but that's how many times alcohol saved my life. And that's, that's, just, that's just the dark reality. And my wife, she didn't call me out too, right? Like she would say, uh, like, I, I know what you're doing, right? And she would say that. What that meant was like, I know you're using alcohol to cope. Like, I know it. <clears throat> and again, my witty response would be, there are worse coping mechanisms. And that's just kind of how I justified it day in and day out. Um, but like I said, definitely not sustainable. But at the end of the day, it was what it was and it it prevented me from taking my own life at the time i definitely had to find better hope though 
Yeah, no, that's great. I, you know, I think part of the problem that we face with this topic of suicide, depression, alcohol, is that a lot of the the public conversations that we may have, right? Whether at a training or in some kind of small group somewhere at, at the unit level, it's hard to go really deep and dark and, and be brutally honest, especially if you're doing well in your career, right? <laughs> you, yeah. you know, the, that, that's like a drug, isn't it, right? When, when society is rewarding you and saying, attaboy uh, at every turn, man, that's like a drug, that endorphin, and you want it more and more and more, and you don't want to do anything or say anything that would jeopardize that. And that gap that's created between how I really feel versus how, the, myself that I'm projecting publicly, it creates a loneliness in and of itself, right? Because every person you meet, you feel like you're kind of faking it, and you come home feeling, or you sit in your car feeling like nobody really knows where I'm really at. And I think the brutal, truthful, honest conversations helps us feel connected. And that's why, you know, your story, I know for a fact, uh, people listening, there's going to be one, maybe 10, maybe 100 people out there that will hear it and be like, you know, man, like, I'm not too far from some of those thoughts. And they could feel a little bit more normal, a little bit more connected and understood, even though you're strangers. And, and that's a powerful human phenomenon that we all need, right? This sense of connectedness. Yeah, let me jump yeah, in, there, Mark. Hey, Mark, let me jump in there and say, you know, when I was working there on the same base, Marine Corps Air Station Fatema with our major, um, you know, our office was right on the flight line. And, uh, and I had many Marines come in um, for counseling uh, to, me, for, to me as a chaplain. And that was a consistent theme that we saw that, that, that we found that very often Marines were lacking that social connectedness. They didn't really have anybody they could just be completely open and honest with, uh, whether that was even their own family and friends, they were just really lacking the social connection they so desired. And so uh, they would come to me and that was great, but at the end of the day, it was trying to help them rebuild relationships and social connectedness. And and you know that's on the suicide model that's uh, that's kind of out there. It talks about that, you know, the reason we can get to that point where we feel like we want to take our own life is because we feel that isolation, um, and then also we feel like we're, our life is a burden to others. Um, and so it's just great to hear your story, um, Josh, as you said that you know you, you finally saw saw yourself coming out of that, and then you began to reach out to the resources, reach, connect with your wife and get reconnected uh, the way that you needed to through your faith as well. Um, and so I'm going to end this session here. We're, we're actually at the end of our time for the second session. Hard to believe time guys goes by so fast, wow. but uh, the, uh, this is great stuff. And, um, and so we're going to end this session here for our listeners and, but we're going to pick it up next time. Um, and we're going to talk more about the road to recovery and talk about some roadblocks that may have been there for you and anyone else out there that's saying, yeah, you know, I'm feeling this way and I know I need to get help, but I sense there's these roadblocks in my way from getting that help. Uh, so thank you everyone that's joined us and we ask you to join us again next time on Zero to 100. Well, welcome back folks to Zero to 100. We continue our conversation with Sergeant Major Josh Ortiz, and what a what a powerful story, and what a courageous man and Marine you are. I mean, I I cannot say enough about how how much it takes to share some of the things you've shared with us, and I really do think you're doing a public service, uh, and you're honoring so many other Marines by uh, giving them a space to to actually process, to talk about and deal with real life matters. I mean, this is as real as it gets. And I just want to thank you again uh, for doing this and spending this time with us. So in this segment, we want to touch on some of the things that is a, no, another common, I'm sure, point of concern for many who are struggling with, uh, whether it's alcohol, depression, uh, or just feeling disconnected. And 
like to hear more about some roadblocks that you think both uh, professionally, right? As a sergeant major, I mean, we've only so far just skimmed the surface of your own uh, transparent uh, issues that you've just, just bravely shared with us. But I'm sure you have stories that you're carrying from your Marines that serve you know, with you. And so what are some roadblocks that you think we really have to kind of have a collective effort to recognize, to call out, and maybe even uh, mitigate as best as we can? Yeah, um, I, I'll tell you, um, when, when I told my wife I was going to get into counseling on medication, uh, I didn't get the response that I thought I was going to get out of her. I thought it was going to be, uh, oh, finally, like, good, like, you know, you know, get to the bottom of this, you know, so we can move forward. Um, but it was, it, it was actually a little hesitant. Um, the first words out of her mouth were, uh, what about your career? Uh, here we built this kind of, you know, this empire. We're very successful. Most, much of my success comes from the foundation I have at home with my wife. Um, you know, she has sacrificed her career to follow me around the world, raise our children. Uh, so not just her, you know, you know, not just my own sacrifices of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, but just, you know, even our sacrifices as a family. Uh, and she starts thinking, you know, uh, you know, are you going to lose the ability to carry weapons? Um, you know, what a what is, you know, what is your hire going to say, you know, when you're, you're taking all this time off of work, people are going to find out, um, you know, these medications, you know, sometimes don't work. You know, she goes into kind of Dr. Google mode and, see, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's some potential, you know, side effects and stuff from some medications. So there's just, uh, she was, she was very concerned. Um, and, 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 and I would say rightfully so, because, the, the roadblocks that that, that I've seen uh, are, are are the stigmas, you know, connected with, you know, people who say I need help. I'm having thoughts of hurting myself, etc. Uh, and I would say, I would say that one of the biggest roadblocks um, is people's personal opinions. Uh, there's really uh, in, in our professional environment, there is no place for a personal opinion. Uh, regardless of, of how you feel about it uh, personally, um, what you say matters, especially uh, if you're a senior talking to juniors, because your juniors are likely going through things. Your seniors are likely going through things. You are likely going through things, you know, whether you're willing to admit it or not. And you know, at one point, you know, I was, I was a first sergeant, I was on medication, the medication I was on, uh, I gained about 30 pounds or so uh, over the course of a year. So now I'm kind of a fat first sergeant. And that's obviously not a thing, right? I'm, I'm supposed to be upholding the standards and forcing them, you know, and here I am kind of physically jacked up. Uh, and, and nobody knows that I'm in counseling and on medication. But at some point, my, you know, my evaluation, my, my fitness report is due. And so I had to go, you know, go to medical, get kind of stuff signed off on, get it, you know, hey, this is a result of medication. It's a thing. Um, and when I went to my boss, who was writing my evaluation, the one that uh, we did not get along, uh, and I kind of, I barely kind of opened up to him. Just said, hey, sir, you, you, I haven't told you about this, um, but I've been going through this. I've been in counseling, been on medication, et cetera. I just want you to know this stuff's got to go in my, you know, in, in, in my fitness report. And he didn't really say anything uh, much. I, I remember walking back into my office and, and in a matter of minutes, he came into my office with the, the printed out uh, separations manual and, and the section where he thought uh, applied to his opinion. And uh, his response to me kind of opening up and telling him what I've been going through was, uh, I'm going to work on getting you separated from the Marine Corps. There's no way you can continue to serve uh, with this with this problem you have, and I'm gonna be working on separating you. And so like, which is, which really just validated uh, why I never told him before. Um, and he and he had he had expressed in, you know, publicly in, in, in front of other Marines in the command, how he didn't think that uh, mental illness or depression or anxiety, like, like these aren't, like these aren't real problems that like we should be having to deal with as leaders that, you know, they're starving people all over the world. There's homeless, there's all these other issues that are, that are real, you know, quote unquote, real problems. Um, and so it really, 
it really kind of validated uh, how, you know, why I had never said anything to anybody up, you know, up to this point. Um, and there, you know, there are some risks associated with, with getting help. We're kind of lying if, if we say there aren't, right? We say, you know, you know, get your help, get into counseling, you know, go on meds, like, like there's not going to be any, you know, repercussions or consequences. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily true. Um, you know, people, who, I, 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 I know Marine in, in another unit out here from a couple of years ago, who's, who's an armorer, right? Like, like he handles weapons, he lives, like he works in the armory. And when he started having, you know, some mental health issues, like he, now he no longer can do his job. And, uh, you know, he's, he, so he's taken out of, you know, what he loves and where he finds, you know, gratitude and, you know, a sense of accomplishment from, and they're like, Hey, you can't be around weapons anymore. So, uh, just go kind of sit in the corner, you know, and, 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 and do nothing. Now I, I realize, right. Like I'm a star major. I sit on a command team. I sit with the command deck. I'm on the CEO's right side. So like, I, I understand the risks that a commander has to, uh, ha has to weigh when he's dealing with, you know, individuals that are seeking help for mental health. But from somebody who didn't tell anybody that they were going through counseling and non-medication, um, they ended up firing the boss and leaving me in charge in counseling and on medication. Uh, on medication, I shot on the rifle range, shot expert, by the way, no big deal. But shot with a, you know, shot with a rifle, <laughs> didn't go psycho and murder everybody, right? Uh, still professionally, you know, doing well. I wasn't just sitting around like mush, you know, in a, in a corner. Um, and so you can still be very successful, still contribute immense amounts to the team, and also still get versions of help that you might need. Um, it's funny, as you yeah, mentioned, I mean, shooting expert. <laughs> have you heard sorry, of, uh, I had a plug in there. <laughs> yeah, have you ever heard of a guy named Adam Brown? It's a book called Fearless. It's an amazing book, such a powerful story, but he's a... Uh, you know, dev guru, tier one uh, operator, sniper, seal. But he has the, like a, if I remember correctly, he had like a crack addiction or something. <laughs> so wow. like, you know, his job taught him to manage chaos, right? And so yeah, just a crazy story of redemption and everything's falling apart. He's got an addiction. He can't shake it. And I forget how, but he ends up losing uh, vision and so they're like, you can't be a sniper anymore. He's like, well, what if I learn to shoot left? <laughs> so he learns to shoot left and qualifies and becomes a sniper at Dev Guru, right? Shooting left. But his life is like a storm. It, it's like a storm in every way. And he does end up, uh, you know, giving his life, I believe in combat. And he, there's a strong faith component to his story too, and just family. And, but I mean, you, you know, as you say, you still shot experts. Like sometimes your capability, right? As a Marine, being able to manage chaos uh, and do well in it can hurt you in your personal life, right? Because, because you can manage it, because you can have that vodka, uh, you know, in the driveway and still go to the next, you know, go to work the next day and crush it. It, it almost enables, right? Like a pattern. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 uh, I, I, I was using it as justification, you know. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, yeah. I was it, I was just justifying my actions by well, like, well, I'm still doing well. Like, yeah. Why would I change anything? I'm okay. Yeah. Or even like, well, it's actually uh, it's actually helping me be do better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, as a sergeant major, have you run into any situations where you had to step in with your lessons learned? And help others like if you could share some of that where it's like okay now this is how you've done things but no i've been there and we're gonna do it this way and, and like if you could highlight one or two situations where you had to take some of your lessons learned and help others yeah absolutely i mean the beauty of having all these reps and sets in is that uh is that i i know exactly what it looks like when i'm looking at it and i can almost I, I, 
I can I can see right through a Marine that's having problems. Um, a couple of years ago, um, it was a kind of one of our sister units out here. Uh, the the Marine was deployed, and uh, her, her her husband was back here, who actually used to be a Marine in 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 my unit, but before I got here, and uh, he had uh, he had drank himself into into oblivion. And, uh, and he had some kids at home with him and the wife can't get a hold of him and nobody can go over, you know, you know, no, you know, nobody can find where he is. They end up kicking the door in on him and, uh, you know, you know, they find him and the kids there, you know, every, everybody's okay. But, uh, I had, I had, uh, I had the Marines who were still in the command who, who, who knew him when he was there. I, I asked them some questions, you know, a, a, about him and kind of what they knew about him and he'd been through some pretty traumatic experiences while he was here in the unit the unit had had a really big mishap uh, uh some marines had died some marines that were very very close to him had had, had died in, in this mishap and uh from somebody who knows uh what drinking to excess looks like uh, I, I immediately said you know, this guy's got this guy's got some problems and so uh, I, I asked the Marines that were in the unit. I, I said, "So will you go get him uh, and 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 bring him here. I, I, I would like to meet him." And they said, "Well, he's got his kids and stuff." I said, "You know, it, it, it's okay. Like, I just, uh, uh, I, I, I'd really just like to meet him." And he thought, uh, you know, when 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 he came to my office, uh, he thought I was going to take his kids away from him, and uh, he was very very. Uh, uh, very defensive, very aggressive. And uh, I was able to kind of pick him apart very, very easily. And I shared with him about 60 seconds of, of my story and how, uh, and how neglecting stress and using alcohol as poor coping mechanisms really took me down a dark path. And before I even finished talking about it, uh, this guy was in tears on my couch. I mean, crocodile tears, snot bubbles, you know, the whole nine. And, and I said, I said, I don't, I don't know anything about you. This is the first time that we've met, but I know exactly what you're going through. Uh, and, and, and there is a way out. And here's how I did it. It may not be the script for you, um, because I do think it's different for everybody, right? Like, like, Marine leaders, commanders, like, like we want the answer, right? Like, like, how do we keep people from killing themselves? Like, like, you know, like, like, what's the answer? Like, well, it's, it's, it's like my counselor said, we don't know. It's, it's different for everybody and you'll know when you got it, which is, which is crazy, right? It's very frustrating for a commander to kind of hear that it's hard to accept. Um, but yeah, I really, and, 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 and I've been able to do that dozens of times. Um, I had, a, I had a Marine in the unit that I'm in now, uh, who's my, he's my pride and joy. He's a success story, but I got to the unit, uh, and, uh, he was coming up on his, on his second assignment for BCP for body composition program. He's overweight. Uh, he's, he's a corporal and nobody's got anything bad to say, like, man, he's, this guy's just killing it. He's great, but he just, I don't know, he's too many cheeseburgers or something like, you know, we just, we just don't know what it is. He just, he's great at what he does, but he's just, he's fat. And, uh, and, you know, our, on, on our BCP program, if you're not making, uh, you know, good progress on your first assignment, we, we don't necessarily always give you a second assignment. And so uh, they were like, hey, like, let's just, let's just skip the second assignment and just, you know, we'll call them a BCP failure and add seven. And in a matter of minutes in my office with me and him one-on-one, -on -one, I had it all unpacked and I, 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 I knew everything. And nobody had sat down with him and said, hey, brother, like, your problem's not eating too much. It, it's, it's, it's something else. I don't know what it is, but you definitely do. And you got to get to the bottom of it. Here's a 60-second snapshot of me. I don't know if that's the path that'll, that, that will help you, but here's some resources. I know this wonderful lady over here who's really great at what she does. I give her hugs every time I see her. She's phenomenal. Call her and just see where it goes. And 
I left for a little kind of mini, mini deployment. We, we, we call it a detachment. It was about a month or so. Uh, and I came back and this guy was, he, I could tell he'd lost weight. He'd got into a good PT regime. He's in counseling, he's getting help. And he, he's got so much positivity in his life going on. He, he, he just looked amazing. Uh, and I made sure to tell him that as well to encourage him, right? Like to give, give him more hope that what he's doing is, is, is the right thing. And darn it, if what a short time later, we were pinning Sergeant on his collar. I mean, it was just, it was fantastic. And I've, I've been able to grab him when I see other Marines struggling with their weight or whatever it is and be like, here's my success story. He knows how to do it. Follow him. And it's just, it's just been incredible. And if, if more, I, I don't think I'm incredible, but I think if more people do, they just care, right? Nobody had sat down with this Marine and figured out what was going on. People don't get fat on their own, right? There's usually something else going on in there. Like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Marines, you know, specifically here. There's usually something else going on here. So what is it? And with me sharing a little bit of my story and being, being transparent with him, we got a little bit of trust going between us and then that just trust can be very infectious and it usually ends up very successful. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's so great to hear. Um, that's so incredible to hear how, like I said, you, you've taken all of your lessons learned and, and now you're able to pour into your, your Marines. That's, that's incredible. And, um, and, and one thing that sticks out to me from what you just shared is that last statement the willing to be open, honest, vulnerable, and to build trust. Um, and, and I think that's that's the key. And I think that's where definitely a lot more work can be done, you know, in the fleet, you know, uh, that as leaders, that they try to, if they work to try to do that with their Marines to build that that trust and, and say, hey, it's okay to open up and share a little bit. And if you can't open up and share with me, then then go talk to the chaplain who can give you that 100% confidentiality. Um, and there's actually, I'll share with you also too, something re very recently, you know, something that we're doing at the uh, MCRDs, at the recruit depots. Um, all the prospective drill instructors are now going through a psychological screening. And, and when they do that, they're asked to be open and honest and vulnerable. Um, and actually what they're finding is that that's proving to be very beneficial because they're willing to open up and be vulnerable about what's going on in their life. And so as a result of that, um, many of them are seeking out the referrals uh, because they're going through this screening process for becoming drill instructors. And so, um, you know, so the more that we can do that in the fleet, I think the better. Um, yeah. And, you know, we started off talking about roadblocks, right. And I think, uh, I think, I, I think trust is, is a, a, a pretty big roadblock. Um, you know, do we have trust in our leadership? Do we have trust in our institution? You know, some of these stigmas, right? Like, well, if, if I say I'm going to get help or, you know, maybe these meds make me fat and I'm going to be on BCP and I'm going to get an adverse finish support. I'm never going to get promoted. Uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to tarnish my security clearance. Like, like, like things are going to get jacked up and, 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 and everything is going to fail. And when I talk to Marines about those types of concerns, I said, I, I said, look at me. Like, I, I have things in my fitness reports that I thought for sure were going to keep me from being selected as sergeant major. And yet here I am. I don't have one P. I didn't get passed at all. I got selected first round. I thought, surely this is, this is going to jack up my security clearance. Well, it was about a year and a half ago. Not only did they renew my TS clearance, but they added in the SCI. Like, Hmm. Like these things that like, I, I think that when you, when you don't get the help with, and, and, and the resources that you need, you are at risk of losing everything. Potentially even your job in the Marine Corps, you will, you are at much greater risk of being separated by not getting help because you're going to go off the rails. Something's going to go bad. You're going to get a DUI. You're going to abuse your spouse. Like something's going to happen and it, it, it's going to be really bad for your career. But as I've proven, taking care of these issues, pushing on, tackling them head on, getting the resources, 
you can still be successful. It doesn't have an impact on, on all of the things that we're afraid it's going to have an impact on. And anybody who's in your way, who's, who's trying to do that, I, they were removed. The people that were in my way that were trying to railroad me out while I was getting help were literally removed. And, 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 and that's an important message. Like, and so when I tell people that, they, they get trust in the institution. They get trust in the processes and procedures. They pursue them. And I haven't seen it fail yet. You know, Sergeant Major, it's great that you are like an ambassador and just like those Marines that came to see you in your office, when they see you telling a story of overcoming and the system actually helping, uh, they, they get inspired, right? They get confident that, okay, maybe I can get help too. Obviously, there's going to be people that somehow fall through the cracks, right? They're in a very toxic culture somewhere. Like, yeah. like, like your boss who said, hey, we've got to figure out a way to ASAP you. Uh, there are people where that actually happens, right? And, and so we want to recognize that there are probably listeners who feel, hey, I, I did something like that and, you know, I got the hammer. And then I know that does exist here and there. And yeah, it usually does. it's because of, because of a poor leadership situation, right? And that's usually the case. But I, I guess I want to highlight how when you cross that line, for me, uh, having worked as a chaplain, I, I feel like there's a line that an individual needs to be willing to cross. And the system cannot cross that for you. And that line is, I'm willing to put everything on the line here to get better uh, because I can't live like this anymore. And that's like a personal line, right? That, that you have to cross. And you crossed that obviously when you were like, when you told your wife, you know, like, you know what, I, I just can't do this anymore. And if that's a Lance Corporal crossing that line, uh, potentially the risks are higher. And yeah, that is, person, right. yeah. And the person you're is right, even Mark. in a more vulnerable situation, right? Because they, don't, they might not have the career and the credibility established yet and they're guilty until proven innocent type of situation. So I guess what I want to highlight is no matter what, though, crossing that line, not necessarily for your career, but for your own long term well-being beyond the Marine Corps. Isn't that really what's at stake? Oh, uh, that's a, that's exactly what I was going to follow up with here. Um, my situation and circumstances is, is, is unique to me and 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 what. I needed to get back on track. That 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 definitely isn't the same for everybody. It's it's literally and it's case by case specific. And and even when Marines think they're doing everything they can to get help so they that so, so that they can stay in and, and, and keep going, sometimes the resources that we have just aren't enough for what that individual needs. And what I tell people is is uh, that's okay, because in, in, the, in the grand scheme of, of, of life, whether it's three years or 30 years in, 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 in the service, we're all going to get out, we're all going to get out and, 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 and have to move on. And so if the level of care that you need is not what the service can give you, then yes, you, you do potentially get separated. But in the scheme of life, that's okay. Because the level of care you need is just, is just elsewhere, and you just need to take that same drive and tenacity that that that, that you were trying to get from the core, uh, el you know, elsewhere because it's out there, and it, and like it's 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 different for everybody. And if it means that when you asked for help, uh, you didn't get what you wanted, um, help often doesn't come the way you want it, but in the way that you need it. And so I, I, I do, I, I have seen it myself where Marines have been separated when they come to ask for help and the, 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 the doctors in their professional medical opinion believe that, you know, the level of care that you need is not, is, is, is not suitable for service. And, and, and that's okay, like I said, because you still have a long, long life ahead of you. And this, is, this will just be a blip on the radar of time. So as, as frustrating as it may sound uh, or, or may feel for those of you who that may have happened to, um, I hope you take comfort in me saying that it's, it's okay. It just, it, it, it just meant that we couldn't get you the help that you needed and you have to find it somewhere else, but it's out there. Yeah. yeah. 
I think as we kind of get to the end of our segment, I wanted to ask you to kind of share with us what, so after the counseling, after the spiritual fitness, you know, workouts at uh, with, through church, your pastoral visits, uh, your honest conversations with the family and the, the rebuilding of your life, what does life look like now? Because uh, we all know some some battles still continue, right? And this is not a Disney film where we can kind of give it a nice happy ending and fade to black. Life continues. Some of the mundane things continue to uh, encroach and some of those old, uh, you know, dark spaces sometimes resurface. So just give us an idea of where you're at now and what are the things that's helping you just continue the fight. Yeah, so honestly, life is not great right now for me. Um, I found myself back on the injured list for a little bit over a year and uh, medical really can't figure out what is wrong with me. And the ride on the wall is likely that I will be potentially retiring soon if we can't, you know, figure this out. And so uh, as this has been going on for a year, which is kind of a repeat from my last, you know, real major injury from years back, um, I've had to combat all of those bad habits and bad coping mechanisms almost all over again. And it is, it is a little bit easier because, uh, because I've been through it and I know what it's like. You know, it's kind of like you had to go back through boot camp again. Like you already know what you're getting. Um, my second time getting OC sprayed in the face, you know, in, in my career wasn't nearly as bad as the first time. It was still really bad. But because I knew what was going to happen, I knew the pain that I was going to experience. I was able to fight through it much easier. I was able to be much calmer. Um, and that has been the experience that I've been going through over the last year. You know, the times where uh, I, uh, I want to drink to cope with stress. It's been a really rough day. I don't know what's going on with my career. A lot of questions unanswered. You know, uh, I, I immediately just want to drink. And I have to combat that because I know where that road leads. And do I fail? Absolutely, I do. But I recognize it. I get back on. Remember, that wasn't good. Remember what happened years back. Let's not do this again. Um, and uh, I know that when I'm in kind of this situation that I'm in now personally, that it starts to impact the relationship with my wife. And so there have been those strains kind of in our marriage that are, that have started to resurface like they did before. And uh, I have to make conscious efforts to communicate more directly and, and effectively with my wife. When I'm coming home stressed out and anxious or even depressed, I call her on my way home and tell her just, hey, just so you know, it's been a rough day, really you know, anxious right now, you know, whatever it is, I just want you to know, I'm trying to work through it, but I, I just want to communicate to with you. So what, cause when I, if I come home and I'm not as helpful as you'd like me to be, or as I usually am, like, this is why. And I think it has been, uh, I think it's been much more beneficial, uh, you know, for my wife and I's relationship and has kind of prevented it from getting back from backtracking. It may not be moving forward, but at least we're not moving backwards either. And, um, but yeah, these things don't go away. Um, I don't, I don't think about killing myself anymore, but I still think about the thoughts I guess I used to have, if that makes sense. And so, and I, and I don't know if that's the same thing or not, um, but uh, it, it, it just kind of is what it is. It's just kind of like a, like a memory, so to speak, more so than a thought that I want to put into action, if that makes sense. I just kind of remember those thoughts. And, yeah, it's and like I don't... legacy habits, huh? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's definitely not a bed of roses, but because I know what those signs and symptoms look like, uh, I can recognize them and do my best to be on the front end of them. Yeah, you know, you're, what you, where you're at now, obviously, so life issues and curveballs and challenges yeah. and surprises, they, they don't, we can't control those, right? And they continue to come. Absolutely. But our response to them may change. And your response obviously is now subtly different, 
And I think that's the key, right? It's not about like entirely becoming a different person where you're now taking on a alter ego, but rather, okay, maybe you did not communicate as frankly as before with the wife in those moments. And now you are, and, and maybe and in different relationships as well. So it's a subtle change, but, you know, I, I think about, uh, there's a book, uh, you know, among the many other recommendations, uh, that there's a book that I'm trying to draw a blank on the title, but there's a book that touches on, it's called The Road Less Traveled, okay, and the author is M. Mm. Scott Peck, and he talks about how in the West, our problem is that we don't think like the East where it says, you know, the Buddhist idea, right, to live is to suffer, right, there's the fivefold truths of Buddhism, it's all about suffering. So they assume suffering. So you kind of develop a way to deal with suffering. And it is, whereas we demonize suffering, right? In the West, like suffering is not right. No, we need to alleviate all suffering, uh, yeah. whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain. But the history of the world says, no, suffering is a part of life. And we have to learn how to just kind of embrace and process that in a healthy way. Absolutely. But he says something profound. He says in our deepest desire to escape suffering, we distract ourselves with other things that become greater suffering. <laughs> so alcohol, right? And, and Brene Brown writes a lot on this, right? In her study on vulnerability and courage. And she says, we love to numb in America. We love numbing. And so we numb with yep. alcohol. We numb with Netflix. We numb with something. And in the numbing, we worsen the pain that we initially had because now that pain is just like screaming at us, but we're being numbed by something else. And the moment the numbing wears off, we're just now like the, the floor has given <laughs> yeah. away. So you are facing now these things more honestly and you're owning them, you're naming them, you're talking to us about them. And I think that's potentially, you know, that, that's the first best step right it's like let's just let's look at it honestly start dealing with it it's gonna suck it, it may hurt uh you might be in the red but you can you're still dealing with it you're still present in the issues rather than absolutely numbing absolutely i'll tell you talking about this is uh is extremely difficult for me uh, it, it, it's really hard. And the times where I get up in front of audiences of hundreds, uh, it, it's, it's, it's even harder. Um, but it is also very, very healing for me as well. Um, I don't talk about it uh, because I like to talk about it. Uh, I talk about it because every time I finish talking about it, uh, somebody tells me that it's helped. And, 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 and that's healing for me. A, a, it's, it's healing talking about emotions, right? Especially as men, very, people who are very macho. You know, we, we think we shouldn't talk about our feelings and everything. That was the real benefit from counseling was just talking and sharing emotions with somebody else. And um, yeah, this is, like I said, it's, very difficult, but also very, very healing for me kind of in the long run. And I kind of even get an itch when I feel kind of, kind of down in the dumps after a while. And it's used probably been months or so since I've talked to people trying to help. Right. And I'm like, Oh man, I got to talk to somebody like who wants, to, <laughs> who's going to listen to my story. Maybe it'll help. Um, and because I, because I need to talk about it. I, I need to, I need to express my feelings and, and, and my emotions and, and I need to get them out there. Right. I mean, there's, there's literally like, you know, neurological changes that, that happen in our minds and endorphins and stuff flowing when we talk about and share emotions. And when I've gone a while without sharing my emotions about anything, I feel it. And, and, and I know I, I need to talk to somebody about something. I need an emotional connection to somebody. Yeah, that's so great. Um, one thing that pops to my mind as we kind of wrap up our last session here is that, number one, thank you so much for being willing and to share your story again. And as you just shared how how it's a hard thing to do, but at the same time, you know it's going to help people. So, uh, so you kind of get that excitement because you know this is helping others. And, and secondly, I would say is that 
you know, you have a story that I know for a fact is extremely relatable to so many of our Marines and sailors that are out there now. Um, and I know that just simply from the work that Mark and I do uh, in, in doing counseling that that your story is very common. And so, so that's definitely my hope is that this story by being recorded on this podcast will definitely be an inspiration to somebody to say, hey, look, here's somebody who's been down the same road I've been down and they got help and it worked. So I know I need to do the same thing. Um, so, so man, wonderful. And, and I just, I hope and pray that that's what occurs as a result, result of having this podcast. Um, so again, thank you. I'm so glad that we met uh, just a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, of course. And, um, and thank you for sharing. And um, yeah, this concludes this session of uh, Zero to 100. And uh, so thank you all so much for joining us. And please join us next time uh, when uh, for our next guest. And as we continue to just bring folks to come together and talk about just the regular everyday things of life and how we can be resilient and bounce back afterwards. So thank you again, Joshua and Mark, and uh, for our audience that's out there, thank you for joining us. This concludes another episode of the Zero to 100 podcast. Thank you all for listening. And until next time, be strong, be courageous.